Hello Minders, welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. Hope everyone out there is doing well, staying safe, staying smart. I just wanted to chat at you for a minute. This is sort of like a little pre-intro intro. intro. Uh, I recorded some extra footage, so this is gonna be a longer than usual video. And I'm doing that just sort of to give you something extra to watch while we're all sitting at home, being a little stir crazy, okay? I know it's not much, and I know it doesn't do anything to make people well, but I hope it's a little bit of an encouragement. Please, everybody, mind the guidelines, mind the social distancing, so we can get through this as quickly as possible. I know there's a lot of fear out there. I know there's a lot of anxiety. But let's take a break from all that today. I've got this episode, uh, as I said, extra long. I actually have two paintings. And I'll be showing you sort of my introduction to painting with a hockey brush. Hake, hockey, however you want to pronounce it. This is my first time ever doing a full landscape with a hockey brush. And I really had fun experimenting with it. So I wanted to share all that with you. And I, I went into a little extra detail on the brushes on several. I'll show you several kinds of brushes. I'll show you my experimentation. And then I'll show you a final painting that I did. And I really had a blast with them. So more than anything in this little uh, pre-intro intro, I wanted to just kind of admonish everyone to keep the comments positive, please. Let's not get into any flaming political discussion, any negativity. Uh, you can do that somewhere else. I'm sure there are plenty of places that if you just want to entertain your worst fears, you can go do that, okay? I know that many of you out there are anxious and fearful. Okay, for those of you who can, please comment and encourage those people, okay? We have all kinds of viewers, and many of them watching are looking for ways to keep their mind off of all of this, all right? So I'm going to be monitoring the comments, and I will quickly delete anything that is negative or unnecessarily off-topic. I want to make this uplifting. You can talk about coronavirus. I'm not saying don't do that, but please keep it positive. Please keep it encouraging. That's one thing I can do here right now. I'm sure there are plenty of forums out there where you can complain and do whatever, but not here. Being smart, being cautious, treating this very seriously, definitely. But there's a lot of fear that is unnecessary. There's a lot of panic that's unnecessary. We have every reason to be hopeful. I really believe that. So everyone out there, encourage each other. Encourage each other in real life. Encourage each other in the comments. I look forward to seeing those discussions, actually. And I probably will take a little more active role than I usually do in the comments, especially if I see a discussion that might be worthy of a little extra detail. Let's talk about the brushes. Let's talk about painting. Let's just talk. Let's, let's use this video as a forum for discussion and creating a little more community fun. Okay? Thanks, everybody. Be kind to your fellow humans out there. Don't be selfish. Please don't hoard. We're all going to come through this. Okay? Thanks, everybody. Hope you all enjoy this extended episode. Well, hello there, minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. And looky, looky what I've got here. So I've been asked a few times if I would demonstrate painting or how to paint or do a video on hockey brushes or hakes. Some of you say hake. I think the correct pronunciation is hockey, hockey. Doesn't matter. I don't care how you say it. So you pronunciation police out there, just know before you go typing me a comment, I don't care. I don't care how it's pronounced. But I'm going to go with hockey, kind of like sake, the uh, alcoholic drink. And these are those brushes. Now, uh, I've got several here because uh, I'll be very honest with you. I'm learning kind of right along with you. I've done some research. I've done some play. I'm going to do some more today on this video and we're going to get into it and just see what these brushes are capable of. For definition, a hockey brush is a goat hair, a soft goat hair brush. They're very, very soft, uh, surprisingly soft. Uh, I didn't realize until I bought a few how soft they were. I see them in art stores all the time. They're used in a variety of different crafts, painting, you know, anywhere from oil painting to ceramics to, of course, watercolor. It's a Sumi companion from what I understand, you know, the the bamboo or the Sumi brushes that are used in like ja uh, Japanese calligraphy or Japanese watercolor. As I understand it, uh, these kind of originated in that vein. Stay! No, it doesn't want to stay. You were staying before, why aren't you staying now? But with a lot of art supplies, it's not real important what they're originally intended for. It's what can you do with them now? 
what can you do with them for watercolor? If you're interested in seeing somebody who paints a uh, landscape with hockey brushes all the time, uh, check out the channel of Dave Usher or Steve Cronin. Those are two that come to mind right away. There's also another one I don't think he posts anymore. He may not even be alive because some of his videos are so old, and that's Ron Ranson. Yeah, there's actually a brush out there with by his name. So check out those three if that's something you're interested in. I don't think that I'm going to become a landscape painter that uses just hockey brushes. Uh, I do want to start incorporating them because as I was playing with them, there's some things that I really liked about them. And we'll get into talking about that. But in general, we're just going to take a look. We're going to take a look at what they're good at, what they're not good at, and some of their characteristics. Right off the bat, I can tell you some stuff that, that I have discovered already. Uh, these right here, these three are Master's Touch brushes. That's a Hobby Lobby brand if you're not familiar. These use a standard typical ferrule like a traditional flat would use. The one thing to note about all hockey brushes is they, they shed. They tend to shed. Uh, these were the worst at shedding, but they were the best at coming to a knife edge point. But I noticed a lot of the shedding that I got was short, shorter than the full hair. So I think what's happening is a lot of times it's just breaking off. Just understand that from the start, you're going to deal with a lot of shedding, especially when the br brush is new. I recommend that you uh, wash it good with soap uh, and pull out it a little bit. That'll get a lot of the initial shedding out. You're still going to get it. But um, back to the individual brushes. So these were the worst. These shed the most. These not quite so bad. These were the best. These are uh, Creative Mark Mandalays. I have a real kind of... <laughs> handcrafted look to them very light glued right into the handle no ferrule at all it looks like they have a sealer around the edge to keep uh, too much wood from soaking in so these were good these worked well um, they did not come to a knife edge which may or may not be important now as I said these are creative mark which is a uh, Jerry's Autorama brand but it's also sold through Amazon these I got through a local art store these are Yasutomo's uh, these are another creative mark. Also, I got through Amazon, but it's a Jerry's Artorama brand. These are the hand-sewn or the sewn-in hockeys. Again, a very light wood. I like the hand crafting on these, which is why I bought these with the, the, the hand-sewn stitching in there. And these I only just opened this morning before starting this video. I've actually tested these. I have not tested these. I hope to be able to paint some with these today. Oh yeah, and I just wanted to make another comparison. It, you know from videos past, if you've watched many of my videos, that I've uh, recommended these often. These look like hockey brushes. They're not. These are the Sterling Edwards uh, blending and glazing brush, and these are hogs bristle brushes. These are very stiff, like, like toothbrush stiff. And these are used, uh, I will use these to pre-wet, so this is a good one. They're stiff, though. They really kind of push the water into the paper. I like that. But there are some blending techniques that you can do with this. So uh, these are not hockey brushes, but I just wanted to make that comparison because they do look very similar. So these came to my attention just recently because I saw an article about John Salmonen. If you don't know who John Salmonen is, uh, this is his book, Master of the Urban Landscape. It does these very detailed, very kind of almost paint by numberish looking designs. Uh, very masterful. It's a really interesting style. He's a contemporary painter. I'll include a link to this book if you're interested in his work. But the article was about uh, his use of these hockey brushes, which immediately kind of caught my interest because I thought, no, wait a minute. I know John Salmonen's work. It's very detailed and controlled. It's very planned. How does he use these? Well, he uses them as blenders. He uses them dry. And that got my attention because that's something I want to try. So in other words, he'll put big wet washes and have water and color and all mixing. And then he will take these dry and he will blend in certain directions. Uh, although I haven't seen a demo, but I've experimented with it a little bit. What he does, I think, is direct and manage the flow in the water by brushing these over dry. Now, if there are any of you out there who have taken his workshop and know exactly how he does the technique, feel free to comment below and let me know. The, these brushes I know can have a very nice organic mark making ability. And a little while ago, you know, when I tested daggers, 
that was one of my uh, draws to that brush. Same here, uh, I want to see what kind of uh, organic and interesting mark making you can do. But I did a warm up piece, uh, just testing, I just wanted to test some brush strokes. And before I knew it, I was doing a spontaneous landscape and really having a blast. I'm going to show you some excerpts from that. It's actually not finished, and I'm going to do that for patrons, I think. But then we're going to get into doing another painting. Let's go to the demo. Well, as I said, this <laughs> originally just was going to be a page full of mark making tests. I, I really hadn't intended on doing a painting at all. And I started sort of gingerly with this small one. Didn't want to overwhelm myself. I'm really not used to painting with very large brushes, so I tend to do things a little smaller, rounds, that kind of thing, or flats about this size. And other than big background washes or pre wetting paper, but you know, just want to see what, what's going to happen. And, um, I guess one of the first surprises was how much water these things hold. They are very soft and you would think stiff, but they're not. They're pretty limp, especially when they're not wet. Maybe not as limp as a soft watercolor mop, but they don't hold their form real well. Um, again, other than some certain ones held a very nice knife edge. Now the ones that didn't, that didn't make them unuseful because they, they had sort of a rough, uh, very kind of angular organic mark making. And I'll talk more about that in the second demo. But not really knowing what I was going to do, I'm just, just painting all different ways. Um, here I'm trying out, very anxiously trying out, I should say, that John Salmon and blending technique. And not really knowing how he did it. Uh, blending wet into dry or just uh, blending the colors where they're already wet, you know, wet into wet. There's no paint on my brush and the brush is completely dry. Here you see me putting down, having put down more color and blending that out. And that turned out to be a very useful technique. If I wanted the color to go in a certain direction rather than push or manage the flow with water I'm managing it with this brush now granted you pick up paint and so as a result it gets fainter when you do that it's still a very uh, usable technique and I will be using that in the future it just adds some control that I think is really neat and yet at the same time it looks really spontaneous I liked where some of the paint went wet and then out into the dry area and it gave a very fine but dry brush look that I don't know, I can't think of another way in which to achieve that in watercolor. I'm just uh, dabbing in some deeper pigment here. I've got a wet and wet vignette basically going. I'm trying anything, just, you know, reckless abandon. This wasn't supposed to be anything, so more of that blending technique. See, here's here's where it was wet, and I just blended into dry. Now, because uh, these things hold so much water, it means if you squeeze them out relatively dry, or not as damp as the background, you will pick up a lot of water. So that was cool and important. So I'm sort of managing the contrast now by uh, keeping the pigment out of the brush and picking up little areas it's like a little bit like painting with white and I do this with rounds and in, in watercolor all the time I produce little intentional back runs or I do wet lifting work great with these brushes and you know it wasn't very long into this and I thought man I, I got a little bit of a landscape going here that's not bad so it was fun it was really fun it, it's interesting because I had not intended to record this at all. So it was just on a lark that I even had the, the camera going. But I thought, oh, there might be something to use for patrons. I don't know what. Uh, so I'm glad I'm able to use that for a little bit of extra uh, viewing time here. Now I kept this fairly loose and washy 
and I did not finish it. And that I will be doing for patrons. I'm going to go in and treat this as one of my normal spontaneous landscapes. Look for the contrast areas, find ways that I can detail it, bring focus to certain areas, and make a painting out of it. Basically my normal phase two in any spontaneous painting that I do. So patrons, watch for that in the future. As the painting starts to dry, it's still wet, but not as wet. Then I'm able to add pigment. The problem is, is you can only do so much wet and wet with these things, and they'll overwhelm you with water, kind of like a mop. And you'll see more of that in the next demo. Here I think the painting is nearly dry, so I'm just adding very... Uh, heavy pigment not without a lot of water more blending and when I'm dry brushing with that blending technique uh, if the brush is not really getting very wet uh, I'll usually go over onto a towel and just sort of brush it off to make sure I don't have a lot of uh, pigment residue I finally have gotten uh, into a regular round or detail brushes. Just doing some last minute picking up and lifting. Uh, since I did have some landforms that looked like they were forming there, it looks like uh, some lake, little island like forms out in the lake. I thought, okay, <laughs> we'll make something out of that. So cool. Well, I'm anxious to go in and detail. I mean, it even looked like uh, some of the dry brush technique that I used, like it made some reflections or something that can turn into reflections. All right, if you saw my last video, you saw me do these gradations where we talked about gradations and you saw me use hockey brushes a little bit in that. And I wanted to make a painting out of it. I don't want to waste this. I had a mar here. I think I scraped the paper. I tried to scrub at that a little bit, but I'm probably going to have to paint something in the sky, maybe a cloud. And if you're going to do a big brush painting, you probably need an open palette like this. This is ceramic, but really you don't need anything more than a styrofoam plate like this. You just want something that's easy to get into. And it's not unheard of to put paint out fresh unless you already have a big brush palette set up. It's just a consideration you want, might want to think through, is how you're going to get paint and water on your brush. Uh, the little pans and little wells don't work very well with these brushes. You're going to be wanting to paint out of big open uh, palettes like this, or as I said, in a styrofoam plate. So I think I'm probably going to be painting with a two inch, maybe a one and a half inch, uh, and then probably one of these smaller one inches. I really don't see myself painting with these big, this is a four inch and I've seen these as big as six inches. Um, but I'm wanting to keep most of these brushes dry uh, so that I might be able to use them as blenders. It's just a word about the colors on here. Um, I haven't used this palette for a while, but uh, if you use a big palette like this, one thing that I've learned, a big open palette, is you might want to just keep the colors limited. One of the mistakes I made was putting too many colors in here, and the color tends to run and pool around the outside edge. I need a blue, so I'm going to put this anthroquinone blue out here. We got a very kind of twilightish blue scheme going. So put a nice, I already have some there, but I'm going to put out some more. Down in this end is Payne's Gray Neutral Tint and Sepia, and I do have a little bit of moon glow there. Over here, I've got, uh, I think, uh, Quinacridone Rust and Red Iron Oxide, which are similar. Uh, I've got Perylene Maroon. I'm not going to put out a violet. I do want to use some violet in here, but I can easily mix one from these reds. So anyway, just a tip. Um, be careful with these big palettes. Don't put out more than, if you're using a plate, maybe one or two colors, something like this, I'd keep it to no more than eight. And a second tip, uh, if you put out fresh color, be careful going into it. Um, you can over uh, apply it to your brush because it is soft and goopy. 
Uh, whereas on pre-dried paint like this, you can rub right over the top if you want to get a lot of pigment. You shouldn't do that with fresh paint. Fresh paint, I uh, would get water on my brush and I would just kind of go up and kiss the edge of it like this. See how much I'm getting. But it's not unusual to put out fresh paint unless you paint with big brush all the time and you have a palette where everything is dried. Uh, it's not unusual to put out paint fresh to paint with big brushes. So that's fine. That's totally fine. This is going to be rather spontaneous. I don't have a big plan. I probably should have, but uh, this is very kind of twilightish. And I wanted to make it look like some open water, maybe some marshy land masses, uh, so I could kind of fiddle with some some brush and grasses, maybe a few dead trees, and some clouds. Uh, now, since this has already been graduated or gradated with color, I'm not going to brush the water in, but I do want to pre-wet it. So uh, I'm going to use a spray bottle. Actually, that's a little bit too heavy. Use a mister. Well, it's not wetting evenly. That's kind of weird. So I am going to lightly brush it just to get it all to mix. Now, if you watched my last video when I did the gradation on this, I don't usually do these landscapes on hot press. It doesn't make the best loose landscape painting. It's better for more controlled detail types of painting, but I don't want to waste it. And we'll give it a go. I think we can make it work. And I'm mainly trying these out, these uh, creative mark hockeys with the hand stitched. Don't think I want to paint any larger than this. But I'm going to get a little perylene maroon and endanthrone blue, and excuse me, anthroquinone blue. Oh, I just flicked some paint over there. That was not intended. Mostly blue though, because we're gonna, gonna want to cover that marred area from before. I don't want it running too much, so I'm gonna hold it level. It's gonna be very monochromatic. Um, I'm gonna use a lot of these same hues throughout. Let's get a little more blue. Some distant. landforms going here. Really puts a ton of water on the paper. I'll switch to the smaller one because it's got a better edge on the on the brush. Better knife edge. Just gonna get some tones mixing here. All right, let's try some of that blending technique. I've got runs happening. I don't mind this uh, forming what might be some reflections, but I want to control it a little bit. So I'm gonna do a little dry brush blending. Try to keep this brush dry, as dry as possible. I kind of lost my clouds up there. Get some Payne's gray. It's going to be a very dark sky, obviously. Right now I'm just kind of seeing what happens when I do something. It's like a lot of ways learning to paint again with strange tools and I really kind of have uh, from the pre-wetting I really kind of have too much water on the paper right now so I need to keep these shapes and whatnot a little bit uh, nebulous and then let it dry I'm fighting glare let's get a big one out here what the heck? Why not? As Bob Ross would say, why not? I'm going to get a lot of horizontal direction in this. Oh. 
That's a nice technique, I think, to have in the arsenal. Just, you know, if it gets over wet in some place or a wash is going someplace you don't want it to. I had never thought of doing that. So, if I can make those clouds do something a little more interesting. This all is going to have to go darker to silhouette against that dark sky. But since it is dark, just brushing this up is kind of making it look more stormy. I like that. Yeah, I wish you could feel just how incredibly saturated this brush is. It, this goats here just holds so much water. And when you need it, that can be a blessing, but it also can be hard to manage. These also tend to go limp. Uh, when they don't have water in them, they tend to, to lose form and shape. The color is moving less, so I'm going to add some, some darks. I'm going to come down here with some warmer colors. Do sort of another gradient. Very faint, but warmer. I get a lot better dispersion on cold press paper. Just another side note for you folks who wonder about the differences. With this much wet and wet I, uh, on a landscape, I would not tend to normally work on hot press. There's some shedding. These brushes actually are not shedding much, so so far I think these may be the best quality of all the hockey brushes I've gotten. And I'm really still just giving myself a base to paint on. I'll come back with some sharper, crisper paint once this dries. I might want to start hinting at some vertical masses going up here that I can paint on top of. One thing I know from uh, experimenting a bit, this thing makes great great like vertical trees like that with the spire type trees. It's just really, really does a good job of that. And just remember from my last video, if you put a level of trees in and then you go for a more distant tree line, make sure you scale it down. One thing I see some of these landscape painters do a lot is paint with the edge. Now see here, this is this is starting to dry up here, so I'm getting a crisper. But I love that. I love the organicness of that, those brush marks there. That's cool. And that's probably something I'm going to use more often. And now if I wanted to mist, mistily fade that out, maybe this technique would be great for that. And it is. Sweet. I'm getting a run here I don't want. So, dry brush blending to the rescue. It picks up some of that excess water in addition to blending it out. Not everything needs to be softly blended, but I think you get the point. Every time I touch this brush to the that paper is just adding a lot of water. Make sure if you're trying uh, the hockey brushes you have some scrap towel, I mean some hefty towels, and you're going to be soaking up a lot of water. A few little scrawny scraps of paper towel are not going to work. Keep plenty of rags. I've got blotting towels over here too in addition to a car wash sponge. So you want plenty to take the moisture out of your brush. And the best way, aside from getting it perfectly dry, the best way is to just get something like a towel, fold it over, put the bristles between it, and squeeze really hard. And then it becomes just slightly damp. It's damp enough that it will pick up water instead of dispersing water. Or I should say it's dry enough. That's kind of cool. I like these, the way these shapes are looking kind of ghostly and mistily sort of blending into the background. Let me get this small one into the act here. I squeeze it dry. As I mentioned, it will be dry enough 
will be damp but it will be dry enough to pick up so push some of that pigment up there to darken those spires a little bit now I'm gonna get some pigment on this brush without adding water because I don't want to put down any more but I want to be able to start putting in some crisper uh, land detail but it's not holding an edge see that it's like like painting with a big old fat brush and I think I, I, I can tell what I just really need to do is let this dry because I need to get more water in my brush and if I do that now I'm going to create a background so these brushes just carry so much water and if I dry them out too much they just totally lose their shape and probably a lot of it is just me not knowing how to paint with them it's mostly dry but um, I think I'm going to continue to let this dry I do want to darken some of the clouds up here so they get really dark and increase this light effect so I'm going to get some Payne's gray neutral tint up here same over here I'm just going to spray it. <clears throat> I'm going to let it backflow because then it looks stormy. Okay, that'll dry a little lighter than that, but it makes the sky look more menacing and it also increases this light effect here. Now, I want to make sure I'm holding it backwards at about a 30 degree angle because I don't want it to come down into the painting. You got to soak up this runoff though or else it, it will come back and create a backwash. It's turning out to be really good at directing those wet and wet washes. Glad I learned about this technique. Could teach an old dog new tricks all the time. We're going to let that dry completely. Well, as we get into the second part of this, um, and this is going to be mostly the foreground. And of course, uh, this is part of uh, this whole landscape where I was thinking more in terms of, of actually painting something. I'm still experimenting to a degree, but uh, it is more, I don't want to say planned, it's still fairly spontaneous. But I did have an idea now that this was going to be kind of a marshy, um, wet landscape. I'm going to leave most of the water uh, as little open bright spots as though the, the light is behind me. When light is behind you and you have landforms and little pools of water here and there, uh, they can be very bright. And most of the, the dark area is in front of me. So I, I like this, this. This whole thing turned out kind of ghostly. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan like I am, this kind of reminded me of the Dead Marshes. I love that that whole uh, element in the book, the Dead Marshes, the descriptors, and I liked it in the movie too. It was really creepy. So this, yeah, this all looks a little bit creepy. I thought I would bring some attention to that center area with sort of a deadfall a tree that had fallen and broken into pieces and there were still bits of it 
poking up here and there. When we get to the detail section, you'll see more of that, uh, how, how I brought that to life a little more. Right now, I'm just working on the major landforms, big to small, big to small, always important. Also notice that I bring uh, a lot of warm colors up front, so maybe they're getting a little more light, but also because of distance, the warmth brings them forward. And this uh, is a good place to also observe scale, the scale that I talked about a few videos ago. Detail is going to be more contrasty up here, and there's going to be more of it, but you want to make sure that as your landforms go back, they scale. And There's really not a lot of uh, tips I can give you on that other than you have to observe. You have to observe how things reduce in size. So I'm paying very close attention to scale and here I'm just using some dark paint to put a base on some of these landforms, kind of delineate where they go from uh, land to water. And usually landforms, shrub forms, tree line forms, most everything in landscape, the shadows sink to the bottom or to one lower left or right side. This is where some of the mark making of this brush I thought was just very interesting and very fun. As I was making those vertical tree spires in the back and even these this deadfall, some of the limbs poking out here, it, it just did some things that other brushes don't do. And I always find that delightful. You can see it's just sort of this fragmented sort of angular-y look hard to describe but you can see it and as uh, these landforms dry uh, again I'm just sort of adding some contrast some darker contrast to the base of them to round them out and now we're into the final details and now I'm discarding the hate not literally discarding but um, using my normal detail brushes no more hockey brushes trying to make uh, those kind of random loose forms look more like a deadfall and I want to bring some detail and focus right there to that that area that little clump Also giving it a nice pop of contrast. And I'm treating it as though the tree maybe fell to the left. And so the branches get finer up towards the left. Maybe that's the top of the tree. Maybe a piece of the trunk is still standing upright. And then uh, just looking for little areas of contrast to define edges. And I don't do this everywhere, but mainly in this center land clump. Try to keep everything else fairly loose. I hadn't plan this I guess maybe subconsciously I had placed that deadfall that upright tree stump but I like the way the clouds are kind of pointing to it and the, the light light area in the back sometimes I, I do do that on purpose but subconsciously on purpose it's, I think a lot of times composition just kind of you see where something needs to go or almost you kind of feel where something needs to go I like pulling up the eye of the viewer through a scene that's just something I think uh, that's really interesting to do in a landscape uh, love 
masterful examples of that and I study that and I try to do that myself. Now I'm going to do some lifting. This is a bristle brush. It's a nylon bristle brush. Probably used for acrylics. But it's stiffer than a normal watercolor brush. So I'm just going to go through again and continue enhancing those edges. And my typical technique for that is clear water, clean water, put it down and brush um, and then blot. It's like using a scrubber. I don't do a lot of heavy scrubbing. It's, but it's a softer technique than using those really stiff scrubbers. I could use a scrubber, but I didn't really need to. This paint came up pretty easily, at least enough to give some highlighting. So I'm just modeling some of those edges again, bringing some more detail to that mass, that land mass. And you'll see me use a couple of these uh, brushes on different sizes. And I might intersperse it with paint going back in the dark areas and actually painting that in or softening some paint that's already down. So it's a combination of all those techniques. Just really, really fun at this point. The detailing is one of my most fun things. You can use those same bristle brushes to actually paint with. So they don't just have to be used for lifting. A lot of times I, if I have it in hand already, I'll glaze with it. Now here I'm using a rigger, by the way. And I'm detailing that brush to the right with some little limbs. Just to add a little secondary area of detail. And some final little treetop details to that deadfall. Very pleased with how this ended up. Hockey brushes I think are great. They're going to be incorporated into some of my landscapes from now on. Definitely. I hope you all enjoyed this. hope maybe this extra viewing uh, gave you a little bit extra something to do in your time at home. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, patrons, for your support. Everybody stay safe out there. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.